Moving on to our next talk, uh, which is by Lowell Eprock, uh, also at Florida International University. The title of his talk is Macroalgal Associations and Seagrass Nutrient Content Status at Deering Estates Shallow Coastal Benthic System. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, can you all hear me and see my screen? Yep. Yep, absolutely. So, um, so for the next 15 to 30 minutes, because we have two presentations left, I'm going to be taking you all underwater. Um, and so what I'm going to present are results of what has been a five years of monitoring of the Benthic community next to Deering Estate and has since been discontinued in 2019. I do hope that whatever information that you got from it, you could be able to use further for conservation efforts in Biscayne Bay next to Deering Estates. So um, without further ado, um, this project has been done by the Marine Macroalgae Research Lab with added support for Deering Estate for um, providing a supplies, um, Department of Environmental Protection Derm for permitting and the NSF Crest Cache for providing funding as I am a currently a Crest Cache Fellow, All right? So before we begin, um, I do want to highlight that if there's anything you want to know about the shallow coastal system of Biscayne Bay is that it is a mix of sea grasses and macroalgae. And, um, and depending on how much this area has been monitored or studied, we definitely have events in the past where macroalgae has been a focal point in the monitoring and conservation of Biscayne Bay. Uh, for example, in, between 2005 and 2012, we had a bloom of anadiomeni in North Biscayne Bay. Um, since 2011 until the present, we've had influxes of pelagic sargassum, which is a regional problem um, in the Caribbean. And so something that needs to be incorporated with, um, with monitoring programs in Deering and larger Biscayne Bay are the monitoring of benthic communities. Right now, I'm going to give my hats off to um, Dallas Hazelton and Baran Chakrain for explaining the wetlands restoration projects better than I can. Um, but I do want to bring it to context and also add that there's not much talk of what happens with that freshwater once it lands into the estuary and marine bay. So prior to a lot of these uh, more recent restoration projects, um, this game bays, um, or really the bay next to Deering is largely marine because of that restriction of fresh water. Um, but with the establishment of the pump station um, from 2012, uh, it was originally um, made to um, offset some of the freshwater pulses that Dallas was mentioning earlier that would have been detrimental to the coastal bay due to its sudden decreases in solidity and increase in nutrient availability. The water that would have been uh, transported using the pump station would give off a more historic sheet flow. And, and the hope is that what is once this marine bay can go back into more estuarine conditions, uh, which can be reflected by the shallow benthic um, vegetation. And so the driving question um, for this monitoring project is what can the macroalgal species composition and seagrass nutrient content can tell us about the status of Deering Estate and which can serve as a proxy to Biscayne Bay. Um, there have been previous studies done on monitoring projects, um, particularly with Black Point, which is south of here. So I'll re be referencing some of those um, previous work there as well, right? So for this study, um, we've had nine different sites and they were sampled over five years from 2015 to 2019. Um, this project has been primarily driven by undergrads, and we have a high turnover of undergrads. This project, one of the things I like about it, it provides research experience for those undergraduates. Um, but the trade-off is, is that the sampling intensity do, can and does vary. Um, throughout this whole study period, we've had a total of 12 sampling dates. And if you want to link that to seasonality, um, eight of them were during the dry season from November to April, and four were during the wet season. I um, mean, each of the sites, we opportunistically collect macroalgae and um, seagrass. For the macroalgae, we identify it to lowest possible taxonomic level and mark that for presence for each of the sites. And for seagrass content, that's, it is cleaned, dried, weighed, and sent to the blue carbon lab for nutrient analysis. We are particularly interested with nitrogen. Although if anyone is interested, we also have um, carbon data. So, 
so when we look at the total amount of macroalgaes, which are, or seaweeds, if you will, um, we found a total of 65 species, which is pretty impressive. Um, the, good, the good majority of them belong to the chlorophyta, the green algaes, followed by rhodophytes, which are the red algaes, and three acrophytes, which are all um, sargassum. I will like to say, even though it's not explicitly shown here, as far as chlorophytes are concerned, the vast majority of those represented are green and filamentous. So you want to think paper thin, ribbony thin um, green algae, which serves in contrast to um, an older monitoring project done at Black Point, where during 2008-2009, um, Collado Vidas and her team found 30 species of macroalgae, and the majority of them were represented through red algae. Right. So this is. So even with site and um, sampling period is concerned, we tend to see this difference in the uh, macroalgal species composition. Um, something that we really did with the presence absence data is we converted it to relative frequency and did some multivariate analyses. Um, this is a cluster dendrogram using the relative frequency of algaes by site. And this is up for interpretation, but as far as my interpretation goes, depending on how you cut it, um, we can see at least five different communities of macroalgae. And I'm going to show what some of these macroalgaes look like um, on the next slide. Um, just by literature reviewing some of the biology and ecology of these algaes, we could say, for example, that right, sulfate calcareous greens and anadiomeni are preferred marine tolerant water. The calerpas in the orange, they have a high affinity for nutrients. Um, these red algaes right here, they like to entangle themselves and turn into, into a mat, which I'm going to be talking about in the next talk. But uh, we have seen at least five macroalgal communities, right? And if we were to overlay that by the site, it's not as clear cut because, of course, there is a lot of variation in site and sampling date. Um, but we could still see some of those associations um, with in terms of the macroalgal assemblages and the sites. And something that we didn't show is we, add, we did an additional cluster analysis, and that's how we're able to clump some of these sites um, to, um, to waste on their macroalgal assemblages. And I think for the rest of these analyses, I'm going to be grouping these nine sites based on the manatee pool, which is zone one. Zone two are areas near shore, um, which are dominated by mostly filamentous algae. And zone three are offshores where we have a diverse array of green and red algae. Um, and this is particularly interesting for me because some of these sites, like site three, which is a rockery, and site nine, which is close to the Cutler Creek, the macroalgae is saying they're more related to these seagrass sites than they are to these near shore, near shore systems, um, which is a point of discussion that could be interesting. Um, something that we're really interested in, so some of the environmental data collected included salinity and temperature. Um, we have opportunistically collected um, salinity and temperature. However, I am aware that there is buoy data by DB Hydro, and I want to incorporate some of that data. Um, but you can see here, for example, in salinity, between these three zones, there is some variation with regards to how salinity is um, trending ov over time between the three zones. Um, but as far as overall trends concerned, this doesn't seem to be a huge difference um, in how the um, of how the salinity changes with respect to zone and date. Um, for temperature data, we have even less data to work with. Um, and so for these zones, um, the temperature doesn't seem to differ between the three zones. Um, and of course, there are some variation in the dates um, depending on when did we sample. Um, but the big takeaway for, for these environmental conditions, um, which is, again, heavily dependent on scale because we were, we were working on a very small scale localized level, um, they seem to act similarly uh, between these zones. So, so it did suggest that the salinity and temperature did not explain differences um, in macroalgal assemblages. Damn. Well, um, what about temperature? Well, I wonder if that tells us anything. So for Nutrients, um, we have collected two um, seagrass species, Holodudi raitii and Thalassia testudinum. Um, there was no mac, no, sorry, there was no seagrass collected in the manatee pool because, of course, there's no seagrass there. So we can only compare between the near shore and the offshore. And you can see that there are differences in the percent nitrogen between the near shore and the offshore, uh, particularly the Holodudi in. Um, 
uh, the percent nitrogen is much lower than in the offshore than it is in the near shore, and Thalassia kind of serves as an intermediate. Um, very interesting. We also looked at the stable isotope um, 15 nitrogen, which has been often been used um, in seagrass tissue content to indicate inputs of anthropogenic um, sources. And interestingly, um, contrary to my initial suspicions of near shore having higher susceptibility um, to anthropogenic input, n than at the near shore. Um, and, th and of course, this is what little data that we have, but um, this is exemplified by a rough benchmark given by the work of Swart um, when he was looking at 15N um, and nutrient inputs in um, with macrophytes. Um, I will say, however, for both of the percent nitrogen or just nutrient data in general, we have so little samples. And something that I want to incorporate is how can we foster collaborations um, between the lab, Deering, and other government officials to keep an eye out for these um, macrophyte biotic um, communities. Um, but you can still see that, for, that somehow um, with the high 15N um, content in the offshore system, it might give us a clue as to why we're seeing differences in macroalgal assemblages. Um, so just to wrap up, compared to previous monitoring efforts, the Deering's macroalgal compositions are roughly similar, but have slightly more representation of green filamentous algae. The macroalgal assemblages can be detected on site or distance to shore, at least that's what the multivariate analyses are telling us. Solidian temperature didn't seem to explain it, but, but nutrient data might. Um, so the nitrogen, in terms of the percent nitrogen and 50N, they can vary based on zone and taxon. Um, use as indicators. And, and the most important thing is that we need more in situ monitoring of our coastal banded communities. And for, and for those that are not convinced yet, I'm gonna tell you right now, it is ever so more important that we need to assess the submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, Vanessa and the Deering team has been part of the Sargassum Watch Citizen Science Team. And she took this lovely picture that I like to dub the clash of the algae. Because what's interesting is that I see not one, but two floating algal communities um, of pelagic sargassum um, dominated by sargassum nates and fluitins, and these green filamentous mass dominated by Clodophora liniformis. And so this kind of begs the question, with all this macroalgal and macroalgal events coming in through our Biscayne Bay, you know, what's going to happen to the benthic community of macroalgae and seagrasses? And so Yes, we do need in situ monitoring. We probably want to take an approach of standardizing um, our sampling with collaborations from departments and agencies. But working with Deering say long enough, I am a huge proponent of citizen science. I would like to see a rapid citizen community driven bioassessment of Deering shallow coastal systems. Um, although we can um, acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to identify macroalgae, even something as broad as Finding red macroalgal mats, green macroalgal mats, and sargassum can take us a long way as indicator taxa and at least three accessible sites that we can use um, based on the outlined zones can provide us, provide us clues um, and a potential um, to use citizen science as um, an agency of education, research, and advocacy into the conservation of these coastal sites. And working with Deering long enough, I've seen events where they've done bio blitzes to lesson plans. And so the potential is there to, to basically evolve this um, education program to the next level, which is citizen science. Um, from here on, I'll take any and all questions related to this chapter, to this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lowell. Uh, we have time for one question. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Please unmute yourself. No questions? Okay.